Well, good morning. My name is Dan. I'm with the media team here at French Church. I'm so excited to welcome you to French Church Online. It's such an honor. It's such a blessing to just be able to, to do these intros uh, every now and then just to say thank you. Thank you for being a part of us. Thank you for, thank you for being a part of French Church today. If you're new to Friends, I want to direct you to our website, chfriends.church. It's a great resource. Uh, there's a bunch of information about our church there, our, our pastor, um, there's past messages and, and just a bunch of things to check out. But what I want to specifically direct you to is our I'm new section. It's a tab in the left corner. You tap on it. It takes you to a form. You fill out real quick. Give us some basic information. And then we'll follow up with you. We'll get you plugged into our newsletter. We'll answer any questions you may have about our church. It's a great way for us to connect with you, for you to connect with us, and ultimately to, to connect with God. Because that's why we're here today, to, to just worship our God Almighty. Well, I don't want to take up too much of your time today, but I do want to just say uh, thank you again for joining us. And let's head on into worship. God bless. I was an orphan lost at the fault, running away. Wretched man in a 
losing fight. Thanks be to God who delivers me. Thanks be to God who delivers me. Christ, Christ alone, come and set me free. Thanks be to God. I love the truth, I've seen the light, but the shadow inside is still alive. I am the battlefield, I am the fight, who will heal me from these wounds I have. alone come and set me free thanks be to God who delivers me God who delivers me. Thanks be to God who delivers me. Christ, Christ alone, come and set me free. Thanks be to God who delivers me. the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name. Seemed like never before, oh my soul, I worship Your holy name. The sun. It's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the evening comes. Bless the
Good morning, friends. Church, it's so good to be with you. I just want to start today by just reminding you, if you didn't know this, I have been praying for you. I've been praying for you personally. I've been praying for you generally. I've been praying for you specifically. Uh, the elders of, of Friends Church have been praying for you, especially if you filled out the, uh, the recent survey we did a number of weeks ago and you listed out personal prayer requests. We've been praying for you over those. We hope and maybe even you found some solutions already and God's answered some of those, but we're standing with you and for you in this season and in this life. Um, and, and for those of you who didn't fill out the survey, we're praying in a broad sense for you as, as, as well. So we started a, a new series last week in which we're talking a little bit about the end times. Now, this is one of those topics that people are very interested in, and it's, it seems to be a rabbit hole we can go down because there's so much thinking and thoughts and, and questions about different verses. But, but I, I said last week that, that we are living in the end times right now. Jesus said when he first came that that was the end times, when he came 2,000 years ago. So, so there's, this whole existence the last 2,000 years has been... Uh, the end times, but it's getting closer and closer. Um, and so uh, we talked about last week how there is a real person called, the Bible calls the Antichrist, but he's not here. He's clearly, um, he, he's not active on the world scene right now. He could be alive, but we don't know. I don't know, you know, all the timing in the day or, or anything like that. But I do know this, that scripture says, um, the spirit of Antichrist is at work and in the world right now. 
And that's kind of the whole idea of this series is we know what the end times look like, but that spirit is already at work. So we need to be discerning and live and learn how to live so we can run with the horses in these difficult times when it really gets tough. So in 1 John, it says this, this is how you recognize, you can recognize the spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. See, this is how you know where a spirit's coming from, what they do with Jesus. Um, Think through our cultural mindsets, our cultural spirits, if you were uh, to say, do they acknowledge that Jesus is God and he became a man and lived in the flesh with us? See, that is what this phrase is saying. It's saying that Jesus has come in the flesh. And, And so... Um, what do those worldviews, those mindsets uh, say about Jesus? Do they acknowledge him? Or it says, but every spirit that does not acknowledge that Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming. And, and listen to this. And, and even now is already in the world. So the Antichrist is a real person. The spirit, though, uh, even though the Antichrist is not here yet, the spirit is active. His, the purpose, the, the move, the, the dynamic of what is going to happen in the great tribulation um, is already at work. And so if you know in times a little bit, you know that the four horse of the apocalypse uh, are the beginning of the tribulation. And those are a metaphor for the start of the great tribulation, this time of, of specific focused turmoil that's going to uh, cataclysmically end in the, the, the return of Christ and, and the summing up of all things. And uh, we're not there yet, but we can see the spirit at work in our world. And this is a time for us to be preparing, to be in training. And so let, let's just touch on the four horsemen again. I'm not going to go as, as in-depth as I did last week, just, but just to remind us, the, the white horse uh, is, is, um, represents disruption and deception. In, in fact, he carries the bow and the crown, and, and it indicates that, that uh, trouble is going to happen and someone's going to ha- come along that has supposed solutions, but those solutions are ultimately rooted in deception and lies. He has destruction and conquering in mind, and that's why it's white. It, it represents disruption and deception. Then there's a red horse. The red horse represents fear and violence. It says the, the rider of red horse removes peace from the earth, that man versus man uh, uh, battle and violence is unleashed against one another, not just national wars, but also personal wars. And then, uh, I mean, if you're watching news these days, we have now seen another war begin in our world. And this war is based on some of these end times things that we're talking about is talking about resources and money. That's what this war is about. And so that brings us to the third horse, which is the black horse, which represents uh, economic collapse. That um, it specifically in the illustrations of this, this uh, black horse, it mentions the idea of inflation, that food costs are so high, it takes a full day's labor to even feed yourself. Um, and, and, uh, So the need is highlighted. Inflation and need are highlighted as part of this economic collapse. We saw much of it during um, the shutdowns and all those. We saw supply chains uh, change. We've seen commerce change, prices escalating. We see inflation. Uh, Even right now in in protesting some of the the rules in Canada about uh, vaccinations and everything for truck drivers, uh, they've begun seizing bank accounts, even for people that, that supported or, or vocalized uh, support for, for these protests. Um, and then the fourth horse is the pale horse. Now, this is not just another white horse. It's not a cool looking tan horse. It is, it's kind of a greenish. It represents disease and death. And so 
that horse represents uh, what, what it says that about a quarter of the population, if it was today, it would be about 2 billion people would be uh, killed from war, famine, and disease. And so here's the point. It says in Jeremiah chapter 12, verse 5, that is kind of the theme of our, our series, why it's titled what it is. If you're worn out in this foot race with men, you know, if, if you and I are just worn out in everyday living, what makes you think you can race against horses? Jeremiah is saying, you know, if, if you're just worn out and just battling mankind on this earth, what do you think you're going to do when you're facing the horses and you're racing against horses? See, there's an implication in this. There's an implication, first of all, rational mind says, no, we can't run with horses, but there's an implication that we can and we should be able to run with horses. And what is he saying? He's talking about preparation. He goes on and says, if you can't keep your wits during times of calm, what's going to happen when trouble breaks loose like the Jordan in a flood? See, uh, it's talking a lot about preparation. And that's what the whole running with horses is about, is preparation. How do we live in the end times? What do we do? And we strengthen ourselves so that we can day by day get stronger and stronger and run with no matter what goes on in this world. The New Testament has a lot to say about the end times. Of course, the Old Testament does as well. But uh, Peter talks about the end times in some of his writing. John the apostle in the, in the book of Revelation talks about the end times. Jesus on, uh, at, uh, in the two gospels, Matthew and Luke, talk about end times. And of course, Paul, who wrote a large portion of the New Testament, uh, talks about the end times in, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and 5 and in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And so that's what our series is, is we in, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and 5, you see Paul talking about some of the, the things and the details and the, the understandings that we need to have of the end times. This is what um, we call eschatology. It's the study or understanding of end things or end times. And uh, so when Paul finishes up calling it that uh, eschatology, that theology on the end times, then it's just like abruptly he begins to go into this nine point checklist. And it almost fe seems out of place. It almost seems like, well, I'm done talking about this. I'm just going to move on. Or he's wrapping up his letter and he's just saying, you know, quick bullet reminders that he should have said in other places. Or the best way to understand this is to understand that he's saying, here's the snapshot. Here's what you need to know. But now here is how you live. Here is what you need to do. Um, in those end times. And so God wants us to know the broad strokes about the end times. That's why scripture, uh, especially the, the New Testament, is not as explicit and, and with, filled with imagery and all these things as, as some of the Old Testament passages. God wants us to know the general things of the end times. It says that we will know the general idea of what the end times are. He, but but he says, no man will know the time or the hour. It will happen like a thief in the night. So how does that happen? What he really wants us to know is not just the details of the end times. He wants us to know how to live in response to the spirit of Antichrist and then the actual Antichrist on this earth. How are we supposed to live? How are we supposed to live in response? In fact, we could have called this message series, you know, checklist for the end times living you know, something of, of that nature. So this is just what I say. If, if, if life is trying for you now in just everyday life, you feel like you're being outrun even in this world right now, um, you need to go to this checklist, these nine things that we've been looking at. And, and uh, last week you talked, talked about uh, the first four, and today we're going to talk about the last five. 
So are you ready? Let's, let's review really quickly the four. We talked about um, we need to run with covering. That means uh, you and I are created for a relationship. We need relationships. God's given us coverings that we operate in and function in, and that is in relationships. We have familial relationships. We have a church relationship. We need each other, and that's why it's so important that we bind together in true fellowship and communion in that sense. Uh, there's also uh, societal uh, systems and, and coverings, but, but you know we're supposed to run with covering. Number two, we are to run with ministry. So in difficult times, there's a tendency to always look at our own needs and focus on our own needs. And, and Paul's reminding us that it's not just about our needs. You know, we need to focus on ministry. In fact, I, I shared this. I said that the antidote for you needing ministry is for you to minister. The antidote, this is when, when you feel so desperately in need, one of the best ways to get out of that need is to begin to get out of yourself and begin to serve and love others with the love of Christ and seeing through his eyes and something happens. It, it heals. It does something powerful. Number three, we're to run with grace. That means in a world that's so contentious and, and so filled with deception and lies and attacking and uh, verbal canceling and practical canceling of people. We need to not repay evil with evil, but we are to live grace-filled lives. The church in these days needs to rise up and be grace-filled in a world that needs the grace of Jesus. That doesn't mean we're just pancakes and people can walk over us. We're not doing that, but we need to point to the true answer, which is Jesus. And number four, uh, we concluded with last week was to run with joy. That means we need to make the choice. We need to make the choice every day. We need to choose joy. We need to rejoice. We need to, again, be reminded to rejoice. It's something you have to on, do in an ongoing way. Uh, it says in Scripture in one place, This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. There's a, there's a choice we have to make. No matter what we're going on and what's going on in this world, we've got to rejoice in the Lord because it is our strength. It's the source of strength for us. And so now let's jump in. If you would, you can follow along in the message notes. The next five found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Let's start in verse 17. And, and Paul tells us to run, that we need to run with prayer. If we're going to run with the horses, we need to run with prayer. Prayer. Uh, one of the shortest verses in the in the Bible is is verse seventeen. Never stop praying. Never stop praying. Um, why is it so short? Because it's so succinct and true and powerful, and it's so clear for us. Never stop praying. Let me ask you a question. Why do we pray? Why do we need to talk to God? God already knows everything, right? He already knows the situation. He knows the, the end times. He knows the past. He knows the present. So why does he want us to pray? You know, we think that prayer is oftentimes getting God to find solutions for me and to, to fix our agenda and our life. But God's plan through prayer is that um, God moves us towards his agenda. See, prayer is, is uh, me moving towards God, me coming into his presence and talking to him and, and hearing him. You know, in, in over 35 years of ministry, I, I sometimes calculate this and I, I realize uh, sometimes vanity, 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 <laughs> that I have preached thousands of messages in my 35 years of, of ministry. Thousands. Um, you might not even be able to remember one of those. And, and that breaks my heart, the hours and the, the prayers and the thought and all these things that, that, I, that I put into it and, and everything. But I, I've always realized, you know, sermons have a role, but they're not the end. You know, um, I've, I've seen, uh, I spent thousands of, of time with, with people in meetings. I've spent 
I probably prayed hundreds of thousands of prayers. I don't know. You know, that, that's up to God to determine it. Maybe less. I, I wish I was more of a prayer warrior. But um, I do know this. We need more than knowing a pastor is preaching and praying for you. We need, I need you to pray. And, and that's, you know, it's, it's not enough to have other p- people pray for you. You need to pray. You need to draw close to God. And I hope you are praying in these days. I hope you sense um, uh, the, the draw to be close to God during these times. And so here's a, here's a phrase I've heard. If you only pray when you're in trouble, you are in trouble. If we only pray when we're in trouble, we are in trouble. And so, uh, church, we need to pray in good times and in bad times, in, in season and out of season. And so we need to do just like what Jesus did in Mark 1. It says, very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. You know, that's in Scripture for a reason, because um, prayer is so critical. It was critical in Jesus' life. Um, It's better when you start early, do it alone, and, uh, you know, start your day that way. Jesus did it. He ended his his day that way, too, and he did it in the middle of the day uh, in that way as well. It says in one place that we are to uh, pray continuously. Whatever we do, do it unto the Lord. We are to pray at all times. So what we need is is we need to learn to live a life of calling on the name of the Lord. That means we call upon Him in the morning. We call upon Him in good times. We call upon Him in tough times. We call upon Him for our family and for our friends and for our nation, for our church. Um, Those kinds of things. We need to learn to call upon the name of the Lord and just live in that. See, prayer is the difference between the best I can do and the best God can do. That's the difference. You know, we always try to do it in our own strength. And prayer is that difference. Prayer is the difference between what we can really do and what God can do. Prayer hooks us to the source of God, the ultimate source of power and resource and peace and strength and joy. And and it needs to be start the first part of our day and it needs to be throughout. We can't keep up with the horses. We can't run with the horses without prayer. So our first point today is to run with prayer. The second one is found in verse 18. We need to run with gratitude. Now, I've preached so many messages or made this comment before, but even when everything is taken from you, it says in 1 Thessalonians 5.18, be thankful in all circumstances. Be thankful in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. Do you hear what he's saying? He's just talking about the end times and he says, but thankfulness, gratitude is going to be important for you no matter what your circumstance, no matter what's going on in the world, being grateful and thankful to God That's the will of God. That's his purposes in you. It's a mindset to be thankful. And so what I have is more than enough. We need to be reminded that what we have is more than enough. It's a mindset we need. We can't even see the blessings we live with every day. We talk about this idea of entitlement Um, on a younger generation, well, we need to stop that. That's not true because we are all entitled because we've had, you know, we just take things for granted. We take things for granted like uh, lights and running water. We are so blessed, even though we have our own pains and struggles and difficulties. um, Life is so much easier now. We need to open up our hearts to the uh, gratefulness so that we can see these things and recognize them and understand that um, God is in control in all these. Uh, I've shared this illustration. I I questioned whether I'd share it uh, again uh, because it can be misinterpreted. But Corey Ten Boom, who was a uh, 
um, Jewish woman who was uh, imprisoned in uh, Nazi uh, prison camps, uh, and uh, her and her sister Betsy. Uh, Betsy was the older one and was teaching her, you know, we need to pray, we need to pray for everything. We need to be grateful, she was told. And uh, so they went into prayer and they began to pray. And then Corey, at the end of her prayer, prayed, thank you for the fleas. See, they were so packed in these barracks that it was just flea infested and horrible and, and it smelled. And But she prayed for thanking God for the fleas. And, and it was like, what? What are you doing? And and But later, if you read it in the story, that uh, they saw the impact of that gratitude even of thanking God for the fleas. You know why? Because later on they realized that because of the fleas, the, the Nazi soldiers and guards would not come in and do the, the bad stuff they did to uh, prisoners in those times. They were left to their own and they were able to preach the gospel and share the word of God with so many people in the barracks because of fleas that kept out the enemy. Now, I'm not saying that we're supposed to thank God for the worst things that happen in our life. Absolutely not. Um, But we can thank God that God is with us in those. We can thank God. um, You know, God is not um, wanting us to quit complaining. And so that's why we're we're thinking. We're, We're to realize the truth of how blessed we are, how well taken care of we actually are. Um, uh, we are better off than most people. If you think about it, there are so many people that live in, in horrendous uh, circumstances and situations, and um, we have more than enough. Even when we're in want, we have more than enough. Okay, number seven. Let's go on. This is, an, this is a critical one. I think this is so powerful, especially in these days, and that is run with discernment. So we're supposed to run with prayer, run with gratitude, and run with discernment. Um, um, I'm going to see different things differently than just how I see things. Not just with my eyes. I've got to have not just physical sight, but I must have spiritual sight. It says in verse 19 and 20 in uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, it says, Do not stifle the Holy Spirit. Do not scoff at prophecies. You want to be successful. You want to run with the horses. When it gets, when the time gets the the toughest, you want to be the strongest. You want to be successful. Then you need to live not just by sight, but with discernment. That means we're walking with faith, but discernment. We need to be in, uh, with some kind of spiritual in tuneness. We need to be in tune with God and his purposes and his plans in the last days. You know, many of you uh, fly, you know, we have some travelers in, in uh, the church and, you know, I, I, I always, I'm not a big fan. I, I love flying because I love traveling. Not a big fan of flying in the sense that, oh, I just feel so calm and relaxed. No, every time you get tense on takeoff and, and landing, you know, I'm not panicking or anything like that, but you know, you feel that. And sometimes you're up in the air and I've been in, in airplanes a few times where turbulence was just out of control and they turned on the, the, um, uh, the lights, the seatbelt lights, you get an announcement from the pilot. Uh, we're going through some turbulence. We're going to try to rise, uh, fly above it. And, um, so, but you need to stay in your seats. You need to be stay seated, seated. I've been where, where the carts that the, the, um, um, servers were coming around with were banging around and it was, it was scary. But every time that kind of thing happens, windy days in Southern California landing in Ontario is like this. You, you, there, there's just crazy feeling like this is out of control. But then once you, you fly up and over and you're above the clouds, it's calm. It's amazingly calm. And here's the thing, that calm was always there. The disturbance was down here. The calm was up here. And so uh, there is calm and safety in in the midst of turmoil. It's just above it. And so, you know, if you think about this for a second, 
Over the last 40 years, did you know 1.6 billion people have received Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior? That's amazing. Over the, the last 40 years that were filled with wars and, and all pandemics and all these kinds of things, God is still working. You know, that 1.6 billion is more people in that 40-year period than the previous, you know, 2,000 years. And so God is still working. There's worldwide evangelism going on. Pray for the Christians in, in the Ukraine. And uh, we need to, to understand that even in the midst of chaos, Jesus is being lifted up. Amen? Jesus says this, when these things begin to take place, and, and when he's talking about these things, these are all bad things. And, and he doesn't say, run for your, for your lives, freak out. Um, he says, stand up, lift up your heads, because your redemption is drawing near. You are ready to break through the turbulence that's going on. And, and so your redemption is drawing near Notice he uses the word your. This is not a corporate statement. This is like everybody do this. He says, you do it. It's a personal thing. Amen? Go through life looking up, not just around. The more our eyes are just on the, the horizontal and not the vertical, the more we're going to miss. We need to live for heaven and prepare to meet Jesus. We need to live with discernment no matter, even now when times are good, that's how we learn to run with the horses. We run with discernment. We have to have an eye, um, a spiritual eye to heaven, a looking at what God's doing and be prepared. Uh, number eight, we need to run with wisdom. You know, what is, what is wisdom? Knowledge is knowing stuff, knowing things, information. Wisdom is how to apply that knowledge or that information. You know, I'll give you an example of, that many of us can, can affirm is we, everybody knows that exercise is important, that you are healthier when you exercise. So that's knowledge. Wisdom is when we actually do it when we actually put our knowledge into play. And, and so um, we, sometimes, you know, people will, will say, you know, this world is not all there is. You got to deal with, with life. You got to deal with your relationship with God. And they, they can reply, well, I know, I know, I know. And, but you know what? I know is not enough because it's what you do with the knowledge. I know the right thing to do. It doesn't really matter if you know the right thing. Wisdom is what we need. We need to run with wisdom, not just knowledge. And so today's the day not just to know about the end times, not to just to know about God, but to live in relationship with God. To, that, that we know how to live in preparation in these end times where the spirit of Antichrist is alive and well. And so... Um, that's why Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 21 and 22, test everything that is said. Hold on to what is good and stay away from every kind of evil. You notice the, those three highlighted things, test. We need to test in the day of deception, in the coming of the Antichrist, the spirit of Antichrist. We need to test everything, everything that is said. We, we can't take um, just people's word for it or even, even quote experts. We can't take that, their word always. We need to listen to, to the voices and truth and discern. It says, hold on to that which is good. What is good? Hold on to it and then stay away from every, every kind of, of evil. So we need to slow down a bit. We need to, to understand that knowledge has a place, but wisdom is better. Wisdom is what we need in these days. You know, there's a song. I, I uh, love this band called 21 Pilots. Some of you may know it, but they have a new song called uh, Never Take It. And, and it's a reflection uh, on 
information and lies and, and being used to, as, as weapons in our current culture wars, um, basically over the last couple of years. And so he says in this song, he says, this is my advice to you after living through this pandemic. He says, you better educate yourself, but never too much. I believe what he's saying here is educate yourself, be, be aware, test what is true, hold on to what is good, but be careful that um, uh, you stay away from just knowledge that puffs up. You need to focus on the wisdom, walk in the truth, walk in, in what you know is right and test that. It says walk yeah, I mean, I think we need to walk in the fear of God. It says in Proverbs 9, 10, the fear of the Lord is the what? Beginning of wisdom. Um, and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. We need wisdom and understanding. And knowing God, it's, the fear of the Lord is not being afraid of God and that He's so mean and angry and ready to judge. No, it's, it's, it's understanding that God is in control understanding that he's sovereign. It doesn't matter your choices. He will not be mocked and he is sovereign. And knowing him is the most crucial uh, thing that we could do. See, Billy Graham says it like this, knowing is horizontal, but wisdom is vertical. It comes down from above. See, we need wisdom from God in these times. We need discernment, see with different eyes. We need wisdom to understand that, that as we look up. See, this is my challenge for us in a practical sense. You know, th this is just one way you could begin to implement some of the five points that I'm talking about today. And that is, uh, say you're going to do your devotions for 15 minutes a day, half hour today, uh, a day, you know, an hour today. You spend five minutes in the Word five minutes in prayer, and five minutes in worship. You do those three things, I mean, you can, you know, double those numbers or however what works with your, your schedule. Um, and, and you are going to, to run with, with wisdom in all that. Um, you're going to run with prayer. You're going to run in, in, in strong with the horses. And finally, the ninth point in Paul's checklist is run with a vision. Now, I mentioned one of the very first ones was run with ministry, but ministry is about others. So, so running with vision, though, is about you because every one of us has a purpose. Vision says, I'm on this planet for a purpose. I'm called. I have a heavenly assignment. I am not an accident. I'm just not one of the specks of dust on this earth that just happens to be here when all this happens. God designed me and planned me and has me here for right now. And, and so uh, I have a heavenly assignment. We have a reason to press on, to keep going, to never give up. And that's why we, we need to run with vision. Notice what he says in verses 23 and 24. He says, now may the God of peace make you holy. Now, a lot of times when we see the word holy, we think pure and perfect. But the word is hagios. Hagios actually means set apart. It means you have an assigned purpose. You are set apart. You are made special for something and for someone. And so it's not just us being holy and pure and perfect. That's not what it's, it's saying. It's saying you have been set apart. You have a purpose. You have an assigned purpose reason to be here. In every way, may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless. Blameless. We see, it's not just about living a pure, perfect life. It's about living before the audience of one, taking what God has given you and your life and living for him completely. Um, and then it goes on until our Lord Jesus Christ comes again. Jesus is coming again. <laughs> this isn't all there is. He is coming again. We will meet him face to face. And God will make this happen, it says, for he who calls you is faithful. <laughs> Did you hear that? For he who calls you is faithful. 
That's why we run with vision. We know that we are here for a reason. We have a purpose, a place. This is the time that God chose. This, for such a time as this, you are alive. No matter what we face in this earth, you have a reason and a purpose. And it's not all the same for all of us. We don't just need something to live on. We need something to live for. And that's, we need, to, we, we need to have vision. We need to understand that we are called. We have a purpose. You know, we, we need to seek the Lord. We need to help others do the same. You and I are called. We're called. The God of peace um, is, it says, may the God of peace make you holy. May the God of peace, you know, it's not, peaceful sometimes around our lives and in this world. In fact, it's quite unpeaceful sometimes, much of the time. But it can be in us. We can go beyond and above the turbulence and run with vision as we, we run according to our purpose. We run with prayer. We run with gratitude. We run with discernment and we run with wisdom. And finally, we run with vision. I hope today you've been uh, encouraged and challenged. I've hoped that, that this, is, this short little series has strengthened you, that's given you maybe, maybe a checklist to go back to when times get tough to go to these verses. Um, this is in, we need to be preparing in this season. God took us through a, an experiential preparation through the pandemic, and now he's saying you need to have a proactive preparation He's fixed that fix and he's trying to work in us. And now he's saying, take this and go forward and move in me. The reality is, as many people are missing him. What I mean is not like missing the mark. We literally miss him. He's not in our lives. And, and there's this sense inside of us, I need more of God. Do you feel that? I think this, this season has been drawing us to realize we need him even more desperately than we understood we needed him. Some of you have never even said yes to Jesus. You don't even know anything about Jesus, but you know you miss him. You know you're missing who he is, that you were created by him, like him, for him. Today, I just invite you to come to him today. Um, you say a simple prayer. It says, if you will confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus um, died and rose again and ascended into heaven and is returning again, you will be saved. I added a few words in there just to make it simple and clear. God forgives us. It's, it's through our trust in his completed work that we can have this relationship. We can enter into a relationship once we were dead, now we're alive to Him, and we can know Him and have confidence and walk in Him. So as I pray for all of us, I just specifically invite each and every one of you that want to know Jesus, that you'd say that simple prayer today. Just quietly in your own words, say, I need you. I need a relationship with you, God. Forgive me. Let's pray. Lord, we just thank you for this day. I pray that everybody that's watching uh, would would understand you're trying to strengthen us that God we need to be prepared so just continue to strengthen us prepare us oh Lord for those that have not yet met you I pray even now you would hear their prayers even now you would make them brand new in Christ Lord we just thank you for all things we rejoice that you are in control in this earth and Lord, we thank you for this checklist for living in the end times. We love you and, and pray for victory in our lives and peace in our homes, in our communities, in our world, Lord. We just love you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless. And uh, join us next week as we begin a brand new, exciting series. You don't want to miss it.